data is a challenge regardless of the industry that you're in, because there's just so many people touching the data at any point yes. within the supply yeah. chain. And the data needs for each part of that supply chain are unique. Some of it is the same, but there are a lot of unique strings of data that you need at the different points in the supply chain to make it efficient and usable and digestible. Because that's the other thing. You could have a ton of data, but if you don't have it cleaned up and synchronized, you can't digest right. it. You can't utilize it. And it's just going to be a hot mess. So I think that people are sitting here trying to say like, well, even within the complexities of RFID or 2D barcodes, if you can get your data to a good spot, it's going to make everything easier downstream from that perspective. Hello and welcome to the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US, a podcast in which we explore the mind-bending world of global supply chains, covering topics such as automation, innovation, unique identity, and more. I'm your co-host, Reed. And I'm Liz. And welcome to the show. Sarah Jones works for Swim USA. Reed and I just had an amazing conversation with her about the work that they're doing within their operations with RFID. She goes over how they use it, the benefits of RFID at the pallet level, at the carton level, and how they're using it at the unit level and how it can improve things like inventory accuracy and how it can make the cross-docking process much, much more streamlined. She also touched on the importance of standards, which is near and dear to our heart, and how data quality can really impact so many things. And then we moved the conversation to 2D barcodes and what kind of information can be encoded in those 2D barcodes. And she said, you know, hey, Sunrise 2027 is happening and you need to get started. Enjoy the episode. Hey, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hey, Reed. Hey, Liz. How are you? Hey. We're good. Thanks for making the time today to spend a little time and share a little knowledge with us. But before we jump into our conversation, if you wouldn't mind, just give a little brief background on yourself and your role at Swim USA and just kind of introduce yourself to the audience. So my name is Sarah Jones Fairchild. I am the Vice President of Sales Operations here at Swim USA. We make, surprisingly, bathing suits. We have private label. We have branded goods. Some of our premier brands are Miracle Suit, Magic Suit. We have the license for Ralph Lauren Swimwear. We also have Longitude and Pembroke, and then a whole bunch of different private label lines. I've been with Swim USA for almost 11 years now. And then prior to that, I've been at North Face and Macy's Corporate and did a lot of stints. My main role in most of those companies have been data analytics and then technology rollouts. So what's really exciting actually talking about coming full circle is I started sort of looking at the RFID way back in the day when Walmart had first introduced it. What is that? Like 20 years ago, I think it was now. Yeah, it's like 2006, 2004, yeah. somewhere around. Yeah. yeah. And then that sort of died off just because of all the things that happened. So it's kind of exciting that it's coming back full circle in my career. But I did really exciting things at Macy's. Like I introduced the signature pad at Macy's, which is like so Ooh. crazy that that was like the big technology upgrade <laughs> back in the early 2000s. I mean, it kind of changed the way that business is done. And it sounds like that's one of the things that you have been focused on in your career. Yep. And so I wanted to dig a little deeper into something that you said. I was also in industry during the early 2000s and started dabbling in RFID and it's so changed since the early 2000s and how people are using it and how it's being rolled out, certainly from an apparel perspective. But can you talk about RFID in general and what RFID is? and how y'all are using it, and why it's important for you at Swim USA and how it's changing your business. Yeah, RFID, radio frequency identification, which is very exciting. A lot of people don't actually know what it stands for. And I think really technology-wise, where people sort of forget what it is, is it can be kind of a little bit of anything. It can be embedded into a sticker. It can be embedded into a hang tag. People are actually starting to sew it into sewing labels and garments. We haven't got to that point yet. What's really exciting is that there's a lot of things coming down the pipe, which is probably going to be the next 10 years, an evolution of it, is it's actually going to be able to get sewn into fabrics themselves. Really, really fascinating. We're just doing the stickers and the tags currently, and there are so many benefits to it. And I think that's the thing is that what's fairly fascinating to me specifically about RFID is that the use case originally, I think that Walmart was trying to really go for was like at the pallet level, right? Like what can we do at a pallet level? And then that changed to say like, well, how can we do it like at a carton level? The use cases have like blown up since then, right? Inventory accuracy 
And that's inventory accuracy in a warehouse. That's inventory accuracy at a factory. That's inventory accuracy at a retail store. There's so many different ways that you can utilize the technology in the entire supply chain. And I think really for me, what's been so fun to work within the genre of this is we started it originally because Macy's was requiring it, right? This was like eight years ago now, I think, where Macy's came out and said, if you're in these product categories for apparel, you need to have an RFID tag on your garments. So we did it at warehouse for every shipment out the door, which was a time suck. It's a cost suck. And we just needed to like not do that. We needed to figure out, okay, I think long-term this has legs. What can we as a company do to utilize the technology itself. If other retailers are going to be requiring it, which they did, after Macy's, it became a waterfall from there. How can we also use that really powerful technology and not just have it be something that is for the retailers? So we have done a lot in our warehouses to scan on the inbound. So we're validating inbound. Our warehouses are validating on the outbound so that you can check your pick pack accuracy. On the end, right, it's checking, like it said, it's 30 units of a style color size because that's actually what's scanning in. So it's really made a big difference in our inventory accuracy. But I think what people forget too is like, if you're trying to do cycle counting and you're trying to not close your warehouse for a full physical inventory, auditing companies love it if you have RFID tags on your garments because you already have that validation. You're validating on an inbound, you're cycle counting, and then you're validating on the outbound. So when you're giving them the data auditing information, it's totally valid the whole supply chain through at the warehouse level. It's even things like that that sort of extend outside of the general business process need. And that's been really impactful. And then our big piece too, is like we're partnering with a company who's scanning product in Asia and making sure that it's correct outbound, even before it gets into a container. What are we packing into the container? You back that up even further and it's a really powerful tool. So you can correct issues before it becomes an issue. A silly question, but I'm asking it because I think some people might still be asking themselves, well, why use RFID? I mean, weren't you using barcodes beforehand? What's the benefit of moving to RFID? Well, barcode, you have to scan it. You have to take it out of a box and you have to take it out of a bag potentially to scan the UPC barcode. But RFID, it is a radio frequency chip, right? So you can have it in a box in the middle of a pallet and you can still scan what that is. So you don't have to take anything out of a box. You can leave it in a box. This crosstalk business, you don't want to open that box. The whole point of it is that you don't want to open that box. So to be able to have a technology in that box that's scannable and readable without touching anything in there, and it's just a wand or a tunnel, however you're going to use the technology, you don't have to touch it. It's done. You can read it. I really appreciate the fact of you sharing the light of that, you know, using a barcode, you need line of sight. Like you have to physically see it. You have to physically scan it. When using RFID, it's like this magic wand. I don't need line of sight. It's a radio frequency that's being kicking off. And I know Liz is going to make fun of me here, but Liz, I did geek out on RFID for <laughs> quite a few years back in the day when it first came out in World War II, when I was just <laughs> leave in the Navy. But honestly, I think radio frequency identification was started around World War II for planes, Yeah, right? It was just like identifying the planes so that we knew who were friend, who were foe. But the RFID we're talking about right now still has a couple of different flavors to it, right? We have passive, we have active, there's different types of frequencies and ranges and these types of things. How do standards come into play with retail and supply chain specifically if they do it all? Oh my gosh, you'd have to have them come into play. A chip is only as good as the technology supporting behind it, right? And I think that's the whole piece of it. GS1 standards, they're saying like, here are the chips that are supported because these are the ones that are like, validated, standardized, readable, and functional. So if you're not using a GS1 standard RFID string, it's going to be a lot harder to get that into your supply chain and have it be usable across the supply chain, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the retailers that you're probably working with, hopefully they're working on the GS1 standards because then that way you pick a tag that's with a nominated supplier for whatever that retailer is and you're good. You can read it. It can be read because it has already been validated and it's part of the standard. If you go outside of the standards, your life's going to be a lot harder because then you don't know if it's going to be valid or readable throughout the whole supply chain. You said the word string and it resonated with me. It was like a nerve. It's context. It's contextual understanding because we're all saying, hey, this is how the date is going to be said, or this is how the identification is going to be labeled and listed so that you have interoperability between systems. Yeah. 
And I think as we sit there and look at like what's coming next, all the different things with 2D barcodes and all the different things with DPP requirements in Europe, which is digital product passport, that's going to require EPCIS, which really is a very fancy term for each product has to be its own unique identifiable item. Serialized. Serialized, right? That's really essentially what EPCIS is. You can't do that without RFID. RFID by default is serialized data. And so without having that, it's going to be very difficult long-term for companies to be able to adhere to all the things that are coming down the pipe. Even though DPP is Europe, and if you're not shipping to Europe, that might not be applicable to you in the next couple of years. But if it's happening there, it is going to happen here. Maybe it's going to happen in five years or six years versus two years in the UK, but it is going to happen here. There are requirements that are already in front of Congress and the legislature, both here and in Canada, that are going to have some sort of requirement within the ballpark of what the DPP is requiring in the next four to five years. And so having that RFID string serialization already in your workflow is really important because you can then build off of that to do all the other things you need to do from a requirement perspective. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because you're pointing out that you need to prepare now. You need to get educated now. You need to start having these conversations now because it is coming. And I've had a couple of folks say to me, oh, that DPP thing, that's really not going to happen. I'm like, yeah, go speak to Mr. Cook over at Apple. (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's happening. Uh, Yeah, pretty sure it's happening. They had to change their whole proprietary powering system for the number one phone in the world by the EU telling them they need to standardize on power supplies for USB-C. That's a great call out. And Reed, to your point, get started now. It's also what data do you have? Because that data in your systems to be encoded in an RFID tag or a barcode or whatever, you have to have the data. And so, Sarah, from your perspective, I mean, you're talking about warehouse, you're talking about upstream, you're talking about downstream. When it comes to the data capture, whether it's a barcode or in this conversation, RFID tag, are you seeing an efficient exchange of that information between your different supply chain partners? So I think the answer is both yes and no for a couple of reasons. And I think I'm just going to say data for a second. I was talking to another GS1 person yesterday and Data is the least sexy thing oh my gosh, in the yes. world. It is the most important thing. And I think that for me, even outside of RFID or 2D barcodes that I could stress to anybody is that if you think your company is really good at data, you're probably wrong. Because all of us, I will be honest, like even internally, like, yeah, we're good. We got like data governance team and we got a report right. like this. And then you start digging in, doing other projects. You're like, oh yeah. man, we're not ready for that. But that's not just us, by the way. Like when you talk to everybody everybody that I've talked to in every industry, and that's the thing that's so crazy to me about this is that data is a challenge regardless of the industry that you're in. If you're in the industry, it's a challenge. If you're in pharma, it's a challenge. (laughs) If you're in apparel, it's a challenge. If you're in hard goods, it's a challenge. Because there's just so many people touching the data at any point within the supply chain. And the data needs for each part of that supply chain are unique. Some of it is the same, but there are a lot of unique strings of data that you need at the different points in the supply chain to make it efficient and usable and digestible. Because that's the other thing. You could have a ton of data, but if you don't have it cleaned up and synchronized, you can't digest it. You can't utilize it. And it's just going to be a hot mess. So I think that people are sitting here trying to say like, well, even within the complexities of RFID or 2D barcodes, if you can get your data to a good spot, it's going to make everything easier downstream from that perspective. So are we successful in that? <laughs> I think we're more successful now than we were seven years ago. <laughs> is that a good it's journey? <laughs> it's a journey. It's an ongoing, it's a forever journey. Yes, yes. It's a forever journey. I think the big challenge truthfully for us is that we've not needed to have all the data available at all the times, right? So for example, on the inbound scanning, you can have it be super basic and just like a quick scan, how many units are in the box, right? And then I can visually do stuff. The outbound, right? You have to program that because it has to be like what's on that GS1 128 label and have those tags, that data live in your system so that if your GS1 128 says it needs to be these 12 things, the system can go say, are those 12 tags the 12 things that should be on that label that we just scanned? So there's definitely some programming in the back end. That actually was probably the easier of all of it. I think as we start to go out from there, that EPCIS level data is where it's going to become a challenge. It's so much data that has to get transacted and live somewhere. 
That's the biggest thing. It has to live somewhere. You have to have a platform for that data to live. And we are just starting to scratch that surface. You talked about some of the consequences of poor data and the challenges of this and just flat out saying, and I think this is good for everyone. It's kind of funny when I talk with my kids, sometimes like, oh, I'm nervous. I'm like, nervous is normal. You're supposed to be nervous, right? Let's just take the anxiety down 10 steps right there. So data quality is always going to be an issue. Data quality is a challenge. It's everywhere. So like we understand that. But do you have some best practices or recommendations, you know, to make it digestible or consumable for people to kind of have like, well, if I'm going to do it and it's always going to be a problem, why would I do it? Right. Back to my teenagers thing. There's lots of companies out there that are honestly in that boat where it's why even do it? Because it'll never be perfect. So I'm just going to stick with my paper. I'm just going to stick with these barcodes. I'm just going to stick with this technology. But they're not seeing the scale of a unified system. Yeah, I think for me, the biggest thing about data, and this isn't just my current company, this is any company I've worked with and any company that I talk to, right, that has a similar challenge. The biggest part is it's not about your internal company. That's how I try to like pose it to my coworkers. It's not about you, but it's about where that data goes. Because if your data is wrong internally, it's going to go out wrong to other people. And especially as we're looking at like e-com is obviously every year it's growing, every year it's growing dropship and marketplace and how global everything is. If your data is wrong and then that data goes out wrong into an e-com site, whether it's your site or a retailer partner site, then that means your end consumer isn't going to have the benefit of knowing what that actually is. I was talking to someone about cheese the other day. If you accidentally put that it's a sharp versus extra sharp, that changes the product. Even though the product is sharp, and you accidentally put extra sharp, you're not going to sell the same thing at that level because that's wrong. You know what it is, but you're- The feedback loop. The consumer doesn't. You know, when we explain it to internal teams, like if it has an underwire, it doesn't have an underwire. It's a very different customer. Yeah. It says underwire and it doesn't have one. And you're wondering why that's not selling. You're going to now know. Mm -hmm. If it has laces or doesn't have laces, you know, for a shoe or a sneaker, or if it's like slip on or not slip on, right? Just that one yeah. little data loop, you know what your product is. So like you could then say like, oh, I'm doing my analysis and I've, oh, I coded that wrong, but I can fix that. I'll just overwrite that in my Excel sheet and then I'll yep. repivot on it and it will be fine. But if you don't change that correction in your system, then everything's going to be wrong from there. When I was back in industry, there was a challenge because owners of the data internally didn't necessarily know they owned the data because there were so many silos. Is that something that you face as a challenge or because you mentioned that y'all have data governance in place, is that something that you've had to work through? Oh, work through, working through. I think it's an evolutionary process because again, I think the real challenge too is how much additional data is needed now than even like two years ago. That's the thing with data is that like every year there's something new that's needed, like how you track and trace within the compliance things that are coming out, what other things you have to put on from like, is it organic? Is it not organic? Where was it sourced? How was it sourced? So data points that even five years ago wasn't there yet. And in five years, there's going to be more data that we're going to need that we didn't need today because of the different requirements. So I think that's really part of the challenge is it's like, you need to get your core data right anyway. Let's make sure we focus on that. If we get core data right, we're 80% of the way there. It's then figuring out how to make sure all those additional data points that are coming on are coming on in a way that, you know, Liz, you don't own it because you happen to own that chain. And Reed, you own your part because you own that chain. And then for some reason, I don't get those chains into the parent chain. So it's all the way through. So that's really, I think, the challenge for everybody is that getting those additional data pieces from all the different stakeholders and making sure you can get it into that core data set so your full value chain can be recognized in any of it, whether it be the RFID, whether it be versus that 2D barcode that you're going to start programming, whatever that is, it still has to be there, regardless of the technology platform you're using to then report on or utilize. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you just brought up something that I want to pick on a little bit more, 2D barcodes. So 2D barcodes, we say 2D barcodes, most people will recognize them as QR a QR code, right? So you mentioned it a couple of times throughout our conversation. How do you think 2D barcodes are going to play in the apparel industry in the future? It sounds like they already are, but do they have a future path too? 
Yeah, for sure. I'll be honest, at the GS1 Connect conference last year, Huma did this unbelievably awesome presentation. And what was really great about it, and I go back to what I said earlier, it's industry agnostic. And I think that's the thing that's so powerful about it. It was like standing room only. It was an apparel and general merchandise track, but you couldn't find a seat. And so many people were from other industry tracks because it is agnostic. It doesn't matter where you live in. A 2D barcode is a 2D barcode. And you can utilize it for so many different things. And I think that was what was so powerful about it. They originally were going to look at it as a way to help curb theft at the store level. And then you could do so much more with that. And they were taking like you could scan the 2D barcode and like a picture of their mascot would come up and you could take a selfie with it, which is like so fun, right? So there's so many awesome branding things that you can do with it to say, oh, look at how great this is. Here's our brand or here's a recommended, you know, if you like this bathing suit, what about this cover up? Or if you like this sneaker, have you thought about these sweatpants? I think it's unlimited. And I think we've just started scratching the surface with what you could do with it, how you can utilize it. But then for me, for my total nerd out world of data, like I need to get so much data in there because of DPP, because of retailer requirements for GRS and RCS and OCS and all the things with claimed recycled and clean water and all the different things that we have to present back to say, like, what are we doing to support the environment in our supply chain? How do you then collect all that data and present it back in a way that is digestible for all the requirements and also for the consumer? Because the consumer wants to see it too. And the 2D barcode is a way to do that because it's so much data. You can't put that in a, in a UPC barcode. It's a dead barcode. It just gives you a number. And that's it. Whereas 2D is unlimited. And the best part about it too is whatever I put in it today, I can just keep adding to it. That yeah. one 2D barcode, I can add to it. Yeah. Yeah. Unlimited in terms of we can link it to link it to link it to link it to link it. I mean, it does yeah. have a data package limit. It does. But, it does. And so does RFID and so does the 1D. But the 1D barcode is really just a license plate. That's yes. really all it is. Whereas the 2D can be a web resolver, right? Yeah. And can really bring us to all this. And it can be customer safety. It could be customer benefits. It could be coupons. It could be retail checkout. It could be inventory. And you mentioned it earlier that you had like stickers, hang tags, labels and garments, but most folks are doing stickers and hang tags for yeah. RFID. And guess what's on the sticker or hang tag? Typically it's a UPC. We'll see it changing to these yeah. 2D barcodes because there's just so much more to get from it. And it's a combination. It's always a combination. Sunrise um, 2027. Sir, I mean, we have to have you on like the weekly show. <laughs> I mean, you've mentioned Connect. You've mentioned Connect, which it happens in June, June of this year in Orlando. Orlando. Yes. No, but I think it's important. I think back to what we said at the very beginning of this, like if you're not getting ready for it now, you're behind. That shouldn't be scary though, by the way. But I think yep. at the end of the day, right? Like 2027 seems like it's three years away. It is not three years away. And I think that's the important part for people to hear is that if you've not started any journey of RFID or any journey of 2D barcode, you're at least a year out from having something mm -hmm. functional that you can put into play that is probably what you want it to be. You can probably do it faster for sure, but to get it to a functional supply chain process that's going to work and be easy and be fully into your full supply chain, it's about a year, right? Because you've got to get all the different pieces yeah. in place. So now you're already at 2025. You're already in 20, you were now at 2025. And that's just to get your pilot kicked off so it's going to take at least another year to get more brands in your company going. Even if you start with one brand or one thing, that one thing, small or not, is going to give you enough learnings to be able to like scale it out. But 2027 is probably really only about a year and a half to two years away from a development calendar perspective. Because regardless of the product category you live in, you're already developing for next year. If you're a general merchandise or apparel pharma, food, your products that you're introducing for 2025 are already in the pipeline. So when you're sitting yeah. there talking about anything else, you've got to get in front of your production cycle to be able to hit yep. into that piece of the- And we, I'm interested in your perspective on this, but we haven't mentioned yet. You mentioned DPP, Digital Product Passport, which come from the EU, but we haven't mentioned ESG, which is our carbon footprints and this yeah, other data. Yeah. They're like, the data that everyone's asking for yep. will just constantly be coming. You can't think evolving. of it today, but you need, it's always evolving. You need this information. And as our hockey friends say, you have to skate where the puck's going to be, not where it is. Yeah. Any sport, right? I said that to my daughter. She plays, she loves field hockey. And I'm like, if you're going to pass to your girl, pass her to where it's going to be easier for her to get it, not where she's standing. Right? That's the whole right. thing. 
I think for me, that's where 2D is so powerful because like I said earlier, I know there is limits to it. But like, I think the really important part is if you have a product on the market today, like the iPhone, for, that's a great example. If they had it on today and there was a 2D barcode that was off, let's say on the back of this case, for example, and whatever the data was today, if all of a sudden in a year from now, I still have this product, but there was a new requirement and you have to be able to then figure out what that was, they can still add to that Correct. ninja chain in your webbed link to that 2D barcode. So we don't have to pull it off the shelves. Don't have to okay. relabel it. Exactly. Don't have to do any of that stuff. It's there. It's done. Makeup. Right? I have a pair. I had to reorder this makeup. FDA regulated stuff. It's also super powerful because like if there's new requirements that the FDA comes down with, what's it in it? There's a new requirement because a state says you need to then require that, right? Done. You can do that. Doesn't matter yeah. where it's yeah. sitting. Doesn't matter who has it in their hand. And that's for every product, for every category. That's the power of the 2D barcode. We do have to start to wrap it up. So I'm going to go with the first of our two questions we ask all of our guests. And that is, what's your favorite technology right now? Could be something you're using at work. Could be something you're using personally. But what's your favorite technology you're leveraging today? The shared calendar. So I know where to get my kids to. <laughs> Which one are you using? Because it's a fight in my house. <laughs> I just, we have iPhones. So we just put it on our like shared calendar on our iPhones. All right. That's where it's, it's important. important. I mean, it's totally important because if we didn't have, I don't think we'd have any idea where we were. It's why I go to the doctor. People are like, do you need a card? I was like, if I have a card, I will lose the card. If it's not no, in my put phone, it right in the phone, it doesn't exist yeah. in the world. And then so you put everybody's in there. I mean, honestly, for me, it's not even this like crazy thing. We launched a, like a project tracking tool at work called ClickUp. There's so many, there's like Slack and I don't even know all the names, but like we use a program called ClickUp and it seems so simple. But I think the thing for me is that we are all so busy and there's so many projects all the time and so much data required all the time that people are getting lost in emails. There's too many emails. I think everyone can agree in the world, there's too many emails. So being able to put something into like a project tracking tool and have all the data in one place. I don't have to go look for an email. I don't have to send another email. Everything's there. It's all trackable. It's all datable. You can put milestones in there, upload files so that if someone's on vacation, you don't have to worry about, oh, they have the file because they're on vacation. Or, you know, people leave and that's the reality of life. And if they've left, it's so much harder to find those things. So honestly, for me, having that project tracking tool has really helped transform how I manage myself, but also how I manage my teams. And can really make a big difference in your brain power, right? Like, does just go one place, man. Like, it's all there. No need. Yeah. So the second question that we ask, personal life, professional life, there's a lot of things that are happening in the world. Has there been something that's blown your mind, changed the way you looked at something? Online learning for my kids. No more snow days. I've never appreciated mm -hmm. teachers more in my life. I hate and love so it true. at the same time. <laughs> With COVID, and I say this in all earnest, I really do. It is amazing that we can do so many things like this. You're all in a different place. And that's powerful for so many reasons, because you can reach out on a global level that we were never able to before. And it's not that it didn't exist, but people didn't really utilize it the same way. We had to during COVID. I think for me, what's great is that we have it. I think maybe I'm old in that I miss person-person interaction, which is why I love that conferences are coming back online and that more people are getting out to those conferences because touching someone's hand and shaking it and being next to that person, it is different and it changes. And I don't know if I ever would have realized that in the same way had all that other stuff not happened. I don't think I'm the only one that feels that way. And I will say too, with the kids, truthfully, with their online learning, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen when my kids and we, by the way, miss a lot of it. So, because my kids are at the age where I didn't have to do the full online learning for the whole year when COVID was going on. That first day that they had to do it, I was like, I'm going to break it. I'm going to throw that iPad out the window. <laughs> Every That's kid it. is like, do you have a green wall? Is that a fish? Do you have a dog? Are you, is that a wall? Purple? What is that? Oh my God. And these poor teachers are trying to like get these kids to like concentrate. And I'm like, I don't even know what's happening, right? When I'm a very smart person and I don't know what the hell's happening. So I think that for me, it's really fascinating to see that rise of technology and how it's been utilized, but also how I think people are starting to back off some of the utilization of that because we miss people. Yeah. And everybody learns differently. Everyone learns differently. I need to touch it and see it. If you just tell me something, I'm a terrible audio learner. Terrible. 
I will literally sit there and type the whole sentence out if someone talks to me and then I'm like, read it. Okay, I got it. Well, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you spending the time with us here today yeah. and you covered so much and I look forward to seeing you at Connect. Yeah, yes. it's be exciting. Yes. Orlando, here we come. Woo. Um, Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Next Level Supply Chain with GS1 US. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe to our feed and explore more great episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to share and follow us on social media. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.